everybody. I'm Marilyn Lichtenberg. And tonight, thank you for coming to this presentation, substance abuse presentation. And we are, I am part of the Civic Club as a co-founder of the Civic Club, and Ada Eric is the other co-founder of, of our Civic Club. We have approximately, I think this is our ninth or tenth event that we've featured. We've had recycling, we've had unclaimed properties come, which 25 people attended, and four of them actually got money back from the state of New Jersey for unclaimed properties they didn't realize were out there. We've had one on the library, the time bank, um, but we, when topics come up that we feel are necessary or good, we send out by email to everybody that's given us their email database and ask them if they'd like to attend. And some people come to one, some come to all events. So if you haven't uh, signed up on the email sheet, I will be passing it around. You're, if, you, if you care to, you can sign up. And uh, at any point, you decide you don't want to get an email from us. And we've done 10 events in three years, so it's not like you're going to get a lot of emails from me. Um, we are the co-founders. Tonight, we are presenting this program with the Health Advisory Board also. And I'm going to introduce you to our, the chair of our Health Advisory Board, and that's Dory Torp. Okay, thank you for coming. And tonight we're going to hear from Ray Ruiz. He is a licensed counselor. He is a substance use counselor, and he is also a clinical school psychologist. He's going to be talking about the progression of substance use into addiction. So here we go. And we need to chime in, ask questions at any point. So as um. I'm really old fashioned, I'm not really good with the technology, so I would like this to be as interactive as possible, um, and it's just really a practical discussion on uh, substance abuse. Um, I guess I'll tell you a little bit about myself, uh, just to give you some background. Um, I've been in the field of substance abuse for about 25, 26 years, um, and I worked in residential treatment with adolescents, and partial hospital care, uh, kids that were on a psychiatric unit, inpatient, outpatient, intensive outpatient, um, schools, um, you know, private practice. So I've had the gamut of uh, in-home services. So I've worked a lot of different, um, you know, uh, services with kids and their families and adults with substance abuse. And I tell you this, you know, not to kind of talk about my resume, but one is that I still do it, you know, after all of these years. A lot of people burn out, come into this field um, and leave. I still do it. I still love it. Um, and another is that I've seen this field really develop over time. Um, not quite as much as I would have liked it to, um, but it has come a long way. And I think uh, I'm optimistic about where we're at. And I think that people are kind of starting to get it a little bit. Um, just for example, I don't know if some of you are familiar with Narcan, right? Narcan um, is now being used for people that go into overdose and, um, you know, it's being used liberally or more liberally <coughs> to kind of just shock them out of an overdose and prevent deaths. It's a little controversial with people, but when I first got in this field 25 years ago, I was doing research and this was already being used in Europe um, regularly as a as a medicine, no, you know, uh, no stigma, you know, I always thought to myself, like, what's wrong with us? Like, why aren't we doing these things that all over the world, if you, if you look at other cultures and stuff all over the world, there's a lot of very, very progressive uh, movements with drugs and addiction and that kind of stuff. We're way, way, way behind. So just as someone being in the field for such a long time, I'm glad to see that we're kind of starting to get uh, some of the things that are effective <clears throat> and that work. Um, so that said, I just want to do a little bit of a you know, presentation, and we have a, a PowerPoint presentation. I'm just going to kind of use this as a guide, um, and I'm just going to talk about some of the differences between use and abuse and addiction and uh, that kind of thing. And um, It's really simple. I didn't develop it, and I have a paradigm. We'll go through it at the end. I didn't develop this. I heard this 
a long, long time ago from a, a professor of mine. I think it was a Dr. Fiorelli. And when he said this, I was young in the field, and, and it just kind of made sense. And it just stuck in my head. And this is really kind of like the framework that I use when I'm working with people that have substance abuse problems. Um, historically, you know, they looked through this book, right, a DSM, and they said, you fit this, 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 this criteria. You're an addict, um, and this is what we have to do. And, and it was just a very cookie-cutter model. Um, and um, even the new DSM, for any of you that don't know what that means, that's the book that's pretty much used universally across psychiatry and mental health um, that diagnoses mental health disorders and other disorders. Um, so you, you get a code and you get a diagnosis, and that determines the type of treatment you get. So they just recently came out with another one, um, the five, the DSM-5, and now it's a lot more practical because now it's opening up to your level of functioning in life. So if you have ADHD, you might have ADHD, but you might be able to function like me. I'm kind of ADHD-ish my whole life, but I can function relatively and it's not a problem. So it's not really a disorder. So they're starting to put things in perspective and learn that there's a severity of things, that one addict is very different from another addict. Um, and um, I say that with caution because some people that work with addicts or in recovery, you know, they're kind of like an addict, an addict, an addict, and once an addict, always an addict. And I think that's where we hit a, a little bit of an obstacle from a treatment perspective. And I think that we took the human out of that, that element. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that and, and how, in my eyes, how this thing works. Um, so the first thing, I think if I can navigate my way through this, okay, when I'm, when I'm working with people uh, in general, I'm really interested in three primary areas when it comes to substance abuse. Purpose, consequences, and control. I need to understand um, how that person has a relationship with drugs and how the drugs have a relationship with them. And it's a, a very different situation um, from person to person and through periods of one's life. And we'll get into this um, in a little bit. But these three things are very, very important to me. Way too often um, I see people that come into a clinic, um, I'll give you an example, um, a 16 year old boy comes into a clinic and smokes weed and drinks a little bit, gets really good grades, um, you know, um, and he finds out that his girlfriend is pregnant and he's really highly stressed out right now and he goes through a four or five month cycle where he's drinking like crazy, smoking pot, his grades are going down, um, he's getting himself in all kinds of trouble and his girlfriend, you know, um, by some you know, um, whatever has a miscarriage, and he's going, Whoosh, oh my God, and he goes back to his normal functioning, if you will. That kid, if I see that kid at that moment, he would fit all the criteria by the DSM criteria as someone who's chemically dependent, perhaps, if we go into that. And I need to put things in perspective, that this is just a snapshot of him in his life at that particular time, and that might not be someone who's an addict. And I see people coming into clinics and all the time that are, um, you know, 99% of the people that come into a clinic that is in a substance abuse clinic for some ungodly reason needs their service. You know, I, I, and I always wonder why do they always need your service? You know, I've been hired for places to do evaluations. Everyone that comes in the door, get them in, get them in, get them in. And that's really not the name of my game, to get them in. You know, my, the, the game is to try to help people. So I find that, you know, a little um, disheartening, and, but that's just the way that it works. So I try to think a little bit outside the box when I'm working with someone. I try to understand that we are working with individuals. So the, the, the three things that I'm focused in really are, are these areas. Um, why do people take drugs? Why do people use drugs? Any Sounds like a silly question. Any ideas? They're addicted to prescriptions. They're addicted to prescriptions. They're addicted to oh, right, pills, heroin, to escape. cocaine. To escape. What? To escape. To escape their emotions, life, reality. Mm -hmm. To feel better. To feel good. To fit in. To fit in. numb their emotions, to enhance their performance sexually, to enhance their creativity, to handle <laughs> fear and anxiety, to feel like they're competitive. Athletes use a lot of different drugs, right? So, so drugs are used for a lot of different reasons. And I think it's really important that we're having this discussion. We're a drug culture. We're a drug society. We probably 
give drugs faster, easier, and more than most societies throughout the world. You know, most people don't go, you know, I have a headache, here, take a pill. I'm a little depressed because, you know, something happened, here, take a pill. I can't watch TV now without seeing 45 commercials in a two-hour period on drugs. Mm -hmm. You know, this was not like this, you know, 100 years ago when I was a little guy, right? So we're a drug culture, we're a society. You know, little kids, if something's wrong, a little St. Joseph's, these little orange pills, everything is... Here's a pill, here's a pill, here's a pill. You're anxious, here's a pill, here's a... I mean, it's just, it's, it's routine now to take... There's a condition and a diagnosis for everything. Your eyes dry, oh, you have this, that, that, you know? So, so we become a real drug culture, and I don't think that's a mistake, but it's important just to understand that when we're just pumping drugs and we're pumping medication into society and we're just flooding, you know, and we're making this normal, there's going to be a problem at some point, you know? Um, yeah. and, and I don't know what separates that person, what's that breaking point. And I think the person that figures that out is probably going to be doing pretty well. Yeah. I think it's very multifaceted and very complex. So when I'm working with someone, I'm trying to work from a very multifaceted perspective. And the things that I'm looking for are those things that I mentioned. Um, People do drugs, and you're right. The things that we mentioned, that, you know, there's thousands of reasons why, but these are some of the common reasons that people take or use drugs. Two things that we didn't mention that I think is important, and I'll tie it into as we go along. Two things are medically and socially, right? Because people use drugs medically, right? There's a, there's a place in our society for drugs, and people use drugs. And when I say drugs, I mean drugs and alcohol. For some reason, I always have to specify that because people disconnect that. When, when, when I'm talking about drugs, you know, people disconnect that alcohol is a drug. In fact, alcohol is probably one of the most dangerous drugs that's around. Alcohol kills more people in this country than all drugs put together. You can die from an alcohol overdose, right? You can't die from a marijuana overdose. You can't die from an alcohol overdose. You can die from alcohol withdrawal. You cannot die from opiate withdrawal, right? So people don't understand that alcohol is a real um, <coughs> profound drug, and I think it gets overlooked because it's socially acceptable, right? So people use alcohol and drugs socially, and people use alcohol and drugs medically, and for a million other reasons. But this is what's going to be important, and you'll see as, as we move along. The, so what's the problem? What's the problem with using drugs? Hmm. Any ideas? What's the problem with using alcohol? You get addicted. You get addicted. I know people that are addicted to their smartphone. Is that so bad? Yeah. Yes. yeah. It might be, right? And, and that they're starting to look at this now. And like I was saying before, as I started out, it depends on how it interferes with your level of functioning. If you're a 15-year-old kid and your dad takes your smartphone because you got low grades and you destroy his house and you start breaking stuff and you're going crazy, that's a problem, right? Some kids behave that way because they're so obsessed with this little device. That's a problem. So yes, you can get addicted to drugs. So what else is, what's the problem? Your addiction could kill someone else. Your addiction or your use can kill someone else. If you're not addicted to alcohol but you're drinking and driving, you can kill someone else. Right? So, part of the problem is what I was talking about before, purpose, control, and consequences. Part of the problem is loss of control. Drugs and alcohol by nature is a mood and mind altering substance, right? That's what makes it a drug. It's a psychoactive thing that's a mood and mind altering substance. So when your mood and mind is altered, you can have an accident, you can kill somebody, um, you can lose control of yourself in a sense where you may do something that you normally wouldn't do if you were high. You may do things that you regret. It lowers your inhibitions and you're likely to do stuff that you look back and go, wow, that was really embarrassing, that was really stupid, whatever. So that's part of the loss of control. The loss of control, very specifically when it comes to drugs and alcohol, is the loss of control of oneself to not be able to stop. Right? The person that's in control of their drug use, and I'm going to talk a little bit, um, I guess generally, and some people get uncomfortable, at any time raise your hand and say, I disagree, that's crazy, I don't really, you know, and I'll, I'll explain myself. I want to make sure that this just makes sense to you, okay? So if, um, if Victoria and I, loss of control is the inability to stop yourself when you want to or you have to, okay? Whatever that means. 
if Victoria and I go out and it's Victoria's 21st birthday and she says, Ray, I'm going out, you're going to make sure I get home safe? And I say, yeah, Victoria, I'm going to make sure that you get home safe. Everything's going to be cool. You party. It's your 21st birthday. And Victoria goes out and I say, Victoria, I'm not drinking at all because I'm going to drive you and I got you. I'm going to have one drink. And we go out and Victoria has 14 beers and she's drunk, right? She's having a good time. She's drunk. And I have four. But I, you know, I'm not really drunk. I'm a little buzzing. Who's in more control? Neither. Neither. Why not? She's really in more control. It was, she was drinking in a social context with someone that she trusted on her 21st birthday in the celebration, hoping that everything was going to be all right and she was going to be safe. She depended on me. And I went over that boundary. I said, I, I'm going to stop at two. And I went to four. That's an inability to stop when one wants to or has to. That's the person that says, I'm just going to light this up. And I'm just, just going to take a couple of pulls. And then I'm going to stop. And smokes the whole blunt to the face every day. Right? That's a sign of a loss of control. The person that goes out to a bar and says, I'm going to have two because I'm driving. It has four or five or six. The person that says, I'm going to have a glass of wine every day, you know, I just have a glass of wine with dinner, but they really have a bottle, you know? It's when, you, when, you, when you're having that inability to stop when you want to, the person that's on probation, the person that, that gets high, and we'll talk about, you know, the use and misuse and abuse, the person that's getting high all the time and now they get on probation and they have to stop. And they make all the excuses in the world why they don't want to stop, why they can't, and this, this, it's starting to get a loss of control. Does this make sense? Okay, so purpose, and loss of control. And I'll get back to that in a second. The next thing is a pattern of consequences. This is a direct pattern of consequences of someone's drug use. What are consequences of drug and alcohol use? Jail time. Jail time. <coughs> Death. Death. Loss of family and friends. Loss of family and friends. Financial problems. Unwanted pregnancies, sexually transmitted disease, falling down, getting stitches, DWIs, um, you know, we can go on and on and on, right? Death, overdose, uh, you know, um, I've worked with people that lost limbs because they had had their legs cut off because they get abscesses from shooting heroin and things like that. I mean, this gets really, you know, profound, you know? There's a lot of consequences. But I'm not talking about our consequence. I'm talking about a pattern of consequences. Again, if... If you're a 17-year-old kid and you go to school and you're, you know, you just started experimenting with marijuana and you forget the marijuana in your pocket and, you know, something happens to happen and you get pulled over by the police and you get busted. That's a consequence of drug use. That's not, if that's an isolated incident, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a pattern of consequences. I'm talking about your mother found it in your pocket seven times and you've been punished and you know you keep doing it. Your grades, you didn't fail on a test, your grades are going down because you failed on 12, 13, 14 tests and 14 exams. Those are, you know, um, one DWI, you know, you might be unlucky. Two DWIs, you probably really should look at what's going on in your life. Three DWIs, you might have a serious issue. You're going to have a real serious issue anyway because you're going to pay a lot of money and you're going to have a lot of problems and you're not going to be able to drive for a long time. Yes? I, I slightly disagree with that because I think the person who has an issue if they decide to drink and get behind the wheel once. You know what I mean? I'm not saying it's an addiction. I don't know. Right. But as far as it, when it comes to that, that could be the unlucky right. part. Well, because, because alcohol is a mood and mind-altering drug. So, so when it alters your mind, decisions. you make poor decisions, right? I, again, I'm looking for a pattern we'll talk about, but I'm going to talk about the difference between use and mm -hmm. abuse. Sometimes people just make really stupid choices yeah. and decisions, and that might not be a drug abuse problem. It was a foolish mistake, but it might not be a drug abuse problem. But it is, it is a, a, a mistake, Okay. Um, so what I want to talk about, and at the end of this, I'm going to give you a little paradigm, and this will all kind of come together to, with you, hopefully, as we're, as we're going through this. Clinically speaking, the drug user, the, the person that simply uses drugs, is a person that uses um, <coughs> only for social or medical use, okay? And this is all relative, and this is where it gets a little controversial, right? So this is a person that's that's just 
is social could be every day. I'm not, I'm not saying, if someone comes to me and says, you know, this is my husband, he drinks every day, he's an alcoholic. That's not enough information for me, right? Does anyone disagree with me? Does anyone think that anybody that drinks every day is an alcoholic? Yes. Depends on okay. how much. Maybe. Depends. Yeah. Depends on how much. It depends on what a lot of cultures have a glass of wine every day. I know some cultures that they give the 12 or 13-year-old kid a little wine with seltzer every day. They grow up with it. That person's not an alcoholic. And if, they, if they drink with dinner, that, that's, I mean, I don't drink, but if they drink with dinner, that's not an drink. alcoholic. Well, that's what but I'm asking you. they need that drink. Well, yeah. now we're getting into a different that's area. An alcoholic. Well, then, well, now we get into a different area. Right. So just someone that drinks every day, that's not enough information for me. So if someone says, you know, this person smokes every day, this, I don't, and it gets tricky with certain drugs like heroin, right? I know that if you do heroin every day for an extended period of time, you cannot get off because you're physically addicted, right? I mean, it's just, it really is a common sense. So that's where it gets a little tricky and we'll get into that. But just someone doing something every day does not make an addict or an alcoholic. It's just not enough information, right? So the user uses socially or medically only. That's the purpose of their use, someone that's just a user. That's not a drug problem. Does that make sense? Okay. We start to go into the misuse care category or the, the experimentation when you're using for any other reason in the world, right? So if you're not using medically and using socially and you're using because it enhances your creativity and it uses uh, you're using because you're running from your feelings or coping with your spouse or anything like that. We're starting to move into an area. This itself is not a drug problem either, provided that you're still in control and you still don't have a pattern of consequences of your use. Okay? So, again, someone could theoretically, theoretically, use opiates in a social context every day and not be an addict. If they are in control... They can stop whenever they want to or have to, and they have no consequences of their use. Is that person who gets high on opiates every day in control? No. They can't stop because then they go into withdrawal, right? So they need more. So by nature, theory out the window. Opiates is very, 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 very hard to use on a regular basis in a social context. Some people use opiates in a social context once in a while. I know a couple of people that are Wall Street guys. They work, they make a lot of money. They go to these parties. They're very big, chic, you know, fancy joints. And people are sniffing cocaine and heroin and they go in and they sniff dope and they, whatever they do once in a while. And they don't do it again for six, seven months. You know, that's a social heroin user. And I know for some people that love heroin and opiates, it's very difficult to comprehend the fact that someone can do that. It just makes no sense to someone that likes heroin that you can do heroin and just not do it again for five or six months. There are people that try opiates and don't like it at all. They get sick, it makes them throw up, it makes them nauseous, they never do it again. So conceptually speaking, again, I, I know sometimes this gets a little controversial, but conceptually speaking, you can do opiates socially on a regular basis as long as you can control it or you're not having a pattern of consequences from it. Now, I'm not advocating this, I'm just putting this in perspective, right? Because when I'm working with someone, it's very important for me to know that this person is taking pills once in a while and, uh, you know, um, but, um, you know, maybe drinking every day. They might be addicted to alcohol and just messing around with pills once in a while. There's all kinds of risk factors, we'll get into that, you know, they where they're going, the progression, and all that other stuff. But they might be addicted to alcohol, not to pills. That's a very different method of treatment, a very different direction that we might go with that person. It's still addiction. Yeah, no, it's, it's absolutely an addiction. And if you're addicted to something, you probably shouldn't mess with anything because chances are you're, you know, you're at very high risk of being addicted to that thing too. Um, I've very, very rarely seen someone successfully be able to, if they were really addicted, be able to stop that thing and start something else and um, so it gets very complicated. This is the drug abuser. This is where we start to go over that line. This is where we start to develop a drug problem. This is that person that's using for any other reason other than socially and medically and this is the person that really starting to show a loss of control. This is the person that's making an, an excuse all the time why they're going to use. They, they, their life might seem like it's in real, you know, there's, there's no pattern of consequences at this point. Their life seems like it's in control. 
Um, they seem like they got stuff together, but they just don't stop. You know, they just keep making an excuse. You know, this is the kid that says, oh, I'm not going to smoke pot anymore. And then, you know, two days later, oh, but my friend's girlfriend, sister's husband's coming from California and we got to smoke. And, oh, but it's going to rain out today and we got to smoke. And, oh, this is my favorite song. We got to smoke. So they're always looking for a reason, right, to just light up or, or to shoot or to whatever they're going to do. This is the person that's starting to display a loss of control. This is a person that can't stop. This is a person that might got might have gotten busted and doesn't stop and you know makes excuses and dances around. Again, if you're an adult and you don't have an alcohol problem and you get a, D, a DUI, it shakes you up, it interferes with all kinds of things in your life and you go, I will never ever drink again and drive as long as I live. If you're a relatively healthy functioning person who made a bad choice. When you have a loss of control, you'll do it again. You'll just have one or two beers this time. You'll test that boundary. You'll keep, you know, trying to mess around with it, and you'll you'll do it again, and you might get busted again. That's where we start to get that loss of control. That person should stop, and they're not. Okay? Does this make sense? Okay. This is where we start to develop a drug problem. Now, if I see someone in a clinic, this moment of intervention is very different from someone that's using opiates every day and has been shooting heroin for five, ten years. Okay, it's a much different perspective and it's a much different way that we're going to go about treating this person and how to deal with them. Okay, this is the beginning of a drug problem. This is the very beginning stages. And people go through these things in and out, in and out. If, um, okay, people go through these stages in and out. And it, the problem with this stuff is, is it's a little bit risky and it's like rushing roulette. What's probably one of the single most best determining factors if someone is going to become an addict or not? What do you think it is? What's, what's the question? What's, what's one of the single, the, the one factor that, that determines, yeah, this person's high, highly likely to become an addict, this person's not so much. Genetics. They say genetics. I was about that. Isn't that just a theory? That they say genetics. It's a theory. My, my opinion, my opinion is that we have all kinds of risk factors, right? We have genetic risk factors, we have psychological risk factors, we have social risk factors. I believe, in my, my opinion, no science, no research. If you have a high genetic predisposition and a very low psychological predisposition, you're in a much better shape than if you have a really low genetic predisposition, but psychosocially you're a mess you're much more at risk of addict addiction, in my opinion. It's just my own experience. So genetics is important, you know? And genetics is, it, it, it comes in different forms. So if Dory and I, let's say, go out and have a drink, right? We're 12, we're 12 year old friends. And we say, we're gonna go drink beer, right? And we go outside and we both drink three beers. And that night I get completely sick, I'm throwing up, I fall down, I bump my head, I wake up in the morning, I have a hangover, I feel like crap. That's genetics. My genes determine how that alcohol responds to me and how I respond to that alcohol. I'm much less likely to drink again, right? Let's say jo Dory has a great time, she's dancing, she's social, she meets people, she had a wonderful time, she's more likely to go the next day. When are we going out again? Right? That's genetics. The genetics determine how that drug responds to you and how you re respond to that drug. So it's a very complicated issue, but they say genetics is the single most important factor. But again, I throw in those other two, psycho and social, because I think they're just as important or even more important. And th when we're working with someone, um, those things become just as important as treating a physical addiction. And we'll talk about that in a minute. The chemically dependent person, this is the person that's just using to, to live and living to use. This is the person that is using for all the wrong reasons, if wrong, right, I don't want to judge it. All those other reasons outside of social and medical. This is a person that just can't stop when they want to, even though they said a thousand times they're going to. This is a person that obviously starts to display a pattern of consequences of their drug use or alcohol use. Now, a lot of times you'll get people that are functioning alcoholics or functioning addicts and people say, but there's been no consequence. 
but that person has a lot of physical consequences. They might have high blood pressure, their liver enzymes might be up high. Yeah, they might have destroyed relationships in their life. You know, they might be addicted to work, highly successful, making a lot of money. And when you step back and you look at that person and you see how their life has evolved, you can start to identify and point out there's probably been a lot of consequences. A lot of times there's a lot of medical consequences that people don't even know what they've done to their body. They don't realize their liver is at like 50% functioning and that kind of stuff. So this is all relative, <clears throat> but at this point, this person is using to live and living to use. Chances are their entire life is revolved around when they're gonna get their next get high. This is the person that um, they say to me, Ray, you wanna go to the opera You know, Thursday night? And I say, I don't really like the opera. And they go, well, I got a quarter pound of this really good uh, bird butt. And I go, oh yeah, let's go to the opera. Like wherever the weed's going, I'm going, right? And I use weed because people don't think that weed could really be addictive. And this is controversial, right? Colorado, I don't know, right? How many people know Colorado? Marijuana is legal to smoke in Colorado recreationally, right? And a couple of the states are getting pretty liberal. And they're doing a lot of edibles, right? Edibles are, I guess, random. It's hard to say, right? Some are really, really good and some are really, really not good. And people are winding up in the ER, uh, you know, a lot now from, from THC overdose. And for 100 years, we thought you can't really overdose on weed, right? Because the weed wasn't really that good. But now they're eating edibles and they're so concentrated with oils. It's just freaking people out. Like they've never, even people that smoke on a regular basis, they've never experienced anything like this. And they get, they, it, their body just it can't really handle what they do. And they wind up in the ER, they get really scared. But there's a, there's a lot of numbers. And so you'll be hearing this, you know, I'm sure politically, oh, people going to the ER because of marijuana. And it's true, it's happening because people, they've never touched something like this in their life. But I use marijuana because um, I think people can become chemically dependent to almost anything. Like we talked about a cell phone. People can become psychologically dependent on things. The, the mind is a very powerful thing, okay? So um, chemical dependency is that person that's just using to live and living to use. Any questions? I, I, I read a study that people who are addicted to the coffee mm -hmm. are highly able to become addicted to anything else. When, when I first started this field a long time ago, <clears throat> I guess people thought that there's an addictive personality. And I, I, you know, I think there might be an addictive personality. I think... Isn't that called the isms or whatever? It, it, yeah, it's a trait, you know, it's just a characteristic that you're that person that just can't get enough of something you like, you know what I mean? You like something, you want it all. And it's just, and that doesn't, again, that doesn't mean that it's bad as long as it doesn't become dysfunctional in your life. You know, if, if you want to help people and you become that person that's involved in the community, involved in the church, you're a Boy Scout leader, you're doing everything because you're addicted to helping people. I don't know if that's a bad thing as long as your own family's taken care of and your own life is okay. You know, so I, I think that there are things that there, there are people I know that are addicted to extreme sports. You know, they love to skydive and they love to do and they do it on a regular basis and they're, they're addicted to it, but they still function. They're not missing work to go out and skydive, you know? They're not leaving, they're not dropping out of school to go ski all the time or whatever, you know? And that's where it becomes, so I think anything really could become problematic. I mean, food, food is a big problem for people. You know, people, you know, people, more people die from food-related things than, than most drugs, you know? So when you start looking at numbers, it really puts things in perspective at some point. Any questions, answers? No, a dialogue, okay. Um, this right here, this, this is just what we're talking about, right? The user in that first column, the purpose is positive, right? Social or medical. The person is in control. They can stop whenever they want to or have to. And they have not experienced the pattern of consequences of their behavior. The misuser or the experimenter, I like to call it, that's the person that's using for any other reason in the world other than social or medical, they're totally in control. They can stop whenever they want to or they have to. And they have had no pattern of consequences of their behavior. Right? Makes sense? Follow? We start crossing over that very thin line into an abuser, the beginning of a drug problem, when that person starts to display a loss of control. 
that person is using for different reasons and they just can't stop or they don't stop when they make a commitment to, they want to, or they need to. Their spouse is telling them, listen, this is becoming a real problem. You know, the drinking, every time we have something planned, you know, you're drinking, it becomes an issue. Um, you know, the kids are going, why is dad yelling at you? He's drunk all the time. Or why is that always sleeping? Or, you know, and a person says, yeah, 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 I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. And that person just doesn't stop. This is where we start to develop a, a drug problem or an alcohol problem. The chemically dependent person is the person that's using all the time, basically. Um, they're not in control. They have a pattern of consequences of their use. Okay? And the addiction on that far end, what's the difference between chemically dependent and addicted? In treatment, they call it chemical dependency. You get diagnosed DSM-4 chemical dependency. What's the difference between that and addicted? Chemically dependent, you just you can't stop because you become physically ill. The addiction is physical, right? Addiction is a physical illness. When you take that substance away from that person, their body has a physiological response and they get sick and they go into withdrawal. That's addiction, right? You get addicted to opiates, right? Percocet, Percodan, Darvon, Oxy, right? All that stuff. You get addicted to physically, right? You get addicted to alcohol physically. I know people don't understand that sometimes. It's controversial. You get addicted to alcohol physically. Alcohol, if you get addicted to alcohol and you go into a clinic, they have to put you into detox, whether you have insurance, no insurance. You'll see alcohol detoxes all over the place. Very, very little for opiate detox. Because if they don't put you in for alcohol detox, you can go through withdrawal and die. So they have a legal obligation to do something with you if you're an alcoholic. A lot of times I work with addicts and stuff, they're trying to get into detox. I said, tell them that you're drinking. Or, or on tell, tell or benzo, because benzos are very dangerous too to withdraw from. I said, tell them that you're drinking, you're gonna get into that detox easier, you know, if you're drinking. And a lot of times, um, it, it, again, it's very difficult to access services if you're a heroin addict, but not so much if you're an alcoholic, right? Sure. But alcohol withdrawal can kill you. Um, opiate withdrawal won't kill you. You may feel like you want to die, but it's not going to kill you. Um, benzodiazepines, which are like tranquilizers and things, can be very problematic too. Um, withdrawal from that can be very risky. Um, most of the drugs of abuse there's not that real serious withdrawal. You know, um, some of the other drugs, even with marijuana, there's some, maybe some agitation, a little moody and cranky and that kind of stuff. But it's not as intense as some of the other drugs. Opiate withdrawal won't kill you, right? So the difference between the chemical dependency and the addiction is the addiction is physical, the chemical dependency is just psychological. What's more difficult to treat? You give someone that's doing 45, 50 bags of heroin a day, and I know that sounds like a lot, but believe me, there's people doing 45, 50 bags of heroin a day. <laughs> I, three times as much, trust me when I tell you. you. You get someone doing that much heroin that's physically addicted, they go into detox, they spend a few days there, maybe a week, 10 days at best if they got really good insurance or money, and that person's physical addiction's over. But that psychological chemical, that, that dependency on that chemical takes years to address, right? So what we've been seeing for the past five years, probably, maybe a little more, are people that were never substance abusers, that were never um, the kind of person that started and progressing and then smoked pot and drank and went to start taking pills and cocaine and partying and, and progressed. That's a traditional progression, right? A, a traditional addict. We're seeing a lot of these people that were athletes, got hurt, started going to the doctor, started taking pills. Were people that were working, you know, guys that work in construction, get hurt, start taking pills. And then before you know it, they can't get off, they can't stop, they, they're taking more and more and more and more pills. I've been to the doctor, and I try not to go to the doctors because I don't like doctors too much, but I've been to the doctors, and I, I mean, for five minutes, the guy's handing me medication. I'm like, I don't want medication, you know? Oh, just in case, I don't want medication. And it's just, they, they, they push it on you, so it's very difficult, you know? The, New Jersey has a database, right? For every person that goes to a doctor and gets a prescription for an opiate, that doctor has to register them in this database, right? Then when you go to the pharmacist, the pharmacist has to register you in the database. They gotta say what you've got and how you paid for it. So all of the information's there, but no one is responsible to regulate it. The doctor has no liability to go, well, you've been to 14 doctors this month for oxycodone. This is a problem. So the data is in there. You have to put the data in there because you're legally liable to do that, but no one's reliable to check. 
Huge problem. So they'll, you know, they'll talk about, well, we have this database and database, but no one's obligated to check it. Okay, so there's no accountability because there's big money in drugs, right? So this is, this, this is why it becomes very problematic. I, I've, we've seen, and I'm sure you know, many have seen, um, the epidemic with opiate abuse is just outrageous. I mean, it's... it's well, part, part of that is because the AMA, the Medical Association, because they're in cahoots with the drug people, and I'll say that publicly anytime, anywhere, they do not treat the illness. They treat the symptom. And that's the problem. I, I don't so know. Even, even that psychological that you're talking about, you take the opiate mm -hmm. for enough time that you, you're Percocet. Mm -hmm. you know, no one knows pain better than I know pain. And you take it long enough, even when your pain is gone, your brain is telling you it's there because it wants Absolutely. that high. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know about cahoots, you know, um, but. The pharmaceutical industry is the most profitable industry on this planet. That's a right. fact. It's the most profitable industry on this planet. Not that there's any, again, we need drugs in our society. There's a good place for certain drugs in our society. But there's very little regulation when it comes to addiction. Incidentally, are there any doctors here? Nurse. Nurse. Do you have any idea how much time a physician spends on addiction in their educational history? Right, and if you don't, I think you might get two hours, I've heard. I think two well, curriculum I hours. It, two curriculum right. hours is what I've heard. It's definitely not a semester. Right, so, you're, so a lot of people are prescribing <laughs> drugs, right? It's part of what you do, a big part of what you do, and you're not learning about the dangers of drugs. I have to agree with Ada on the symptom thing, because, and, and I am a nurse, and I'm actually a nurse in a jail. So all of this... So you see all this stuff. I, and a hundred bags a day, a heroin addict, is not, not uncommon. uncommon. Not uncommon. But I know for myself, and I also have arthritis, Ada and I were on the squads together, but the doctors are always throwing the medicine out because they want you to be happy when you walk out the door. Thank God I have insurance. People that don't have insurance, now they get the pill, it takes the problem away for a while, they're happy. But in my case, I'm like, no, I want to know what's causing this. Right. I've had to fight to go to the doctor, because they were more than willing to say, oh, just take a Percocet, it'll be gone, be it. Right. And I won't take them. So I think the mindset of the, what is it, AMA? AMA. Has to change, too. And it is changing. I've seen it change from when I first became a nurse to now. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if the damage isn't already done, because it's not just with painkillers, it's also with the antibiotics. Everything. It's everything. 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 But, but on, that, on that note, it is starting to change it because is. St. Joe's initiated a opiate free hospital. Zero free. Yep. And, and now, because it's working there, yep. other hospitals throughout the nation, I just read the you know, Journal of American Medicine, and you'll see, and they're, yep. they're like, the doctors are now really becoming amazed that alternative medicine actually works. Why do you think it took this long? Because it took that many deaths. Yeah, because... 157 Americans die every single day. It's a huge epidemic. From opiate It's poisoning. a huge epidemic. And now it's started to affect all those people that make these decisions. And doctors' children, and politicians' children. And it's, it's a huge epidemic. every barrier to and, every family. And now right? when, it's, it's when you feel it... Anymore. Right. It's, it's the boy singing in the church choir. That's right. You're, you know, valedictorians and, you know... Wall Street people and everyday people, not just a junkie anymore. Any, anywhere I go, with this room right here, if there's 30 people in the room, I'll guarantee that there's at least five people in the room that has a prescription of some kind of painkiller in their medicine cabinet. I'm not judging it, it's just the way that it is, right? So now you get someone that likes pills and they come to your house and visit. What do you think, what do you think someone that likes pills does? They go to the bathroom. They go to the bathroom, they go right to your medicine cabinet. What do they have, what do they have, right? This is, and they're just so available. I work with kids. It's easier for kids to get OxyContin than it is to a pack of cigarettes sometimes. Okay? It's easier for them to get their hands on a bag of dope than to buy a bottle of beer in, in, the, in, in a liquor store, to get someone who wouldn't get them a bottle of beer. So it's really, really easily accessible. And again, it, this is a very, very, very complex issue. So just to talk about the comparisons with... Um, you know, addressing these issues. In Portugal, about five years ago, a little longer, 
Portugal have one of the biggest, and they may, they're pretty up there, they have one of the highest rates of opiate addiction in the world, okay? So what the Portuguese did is they got the drug czar, whoever the guy is, right? And they got that and they said, we need to address this issue. We need to do something. So they got this panel together and they said, well, what are we going to do? We're going to get the best minds in addiction that we know and we're going to get these people, we're going to talk about this. But the rule is we have to follow the recommendations. We don't care what we think we don't care what you know our opinions are. We're going to get the money and follow their recommendations. So this panel of people came in and they said, listen, this addiction is a socioeconomic problem. It's because people are in despair. It's because there's no jobs, because people don't feel good about themselves. There's no vitality, blah, 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 blah. We're going to create these programs that get people to work and et cetera, et cetera. They take um, a mechanic and they go to a garage and they say, you're going to give this guy a job get for three years and we're going to pay 50% of his salary as long as he shows up to work and stays in treatment. And we're going to give him a job and we're going to pay him a good salary. They've reduced their, their, heroin, their heroin addiction by 50% in like a three year period in Portugal. It's a model that works. No treatment in the world is as effective as that model that Portugal did. And again, we may get this 20 years from now, we may go, oh, look at what they were doing in Europe. Just like they do with the Narcan that's been used in Europe for a long, long time. So, there are models and there's philosophies and there's, this is a very complex issue. There's politics involved, there's money involved, there's, you know, whatever. There's all kinds of stuff involved here. And there's a lot of money in drugs and there's a lot of money in drug addiction. Drugs is probably the only commodity that I know that touches every single aspect of society in the world. The poorest of the poor to the richest of the rich. There's nobody in between that is not touched by the drug issue, whether it's money coming in. Or every, every, it's the commodity that everyone capitalizes on. Treatment, drug use, addiction, corrections, jail, you know, it's just pharmaceuticals, industry. It's, it's a huge profitable industry. So I don't know, that said, I don't know where it's going to go, but I think that we're having these discussions and that people are addressing these issues. I think it's very important to talk about legalization, non-legalization. I don't know what you think, but let's have the discussion. What's going on with this world? Let's throw it on the table. Then we can sort it out. We're not hiding from it. We're not saying, well, it's not in our neighborhood. That's when it gets you, you know, when, when, you, when you're hiding from it. Let's talk about it and let's address it proactively. And I think that's really the way to go. But the model here, again, when someone's coming into treatment, this determines how I work with someone. I need to know why they're getting high. Are you getting high because every time your girlfriend has a fight with you, you're using? That's very different if you get high because you're one of these kids that go out to parties every Saturday or Sunday and you're having drinks with your friends. I'm not saying one's better than the other, but it's a very different dynamic. It's a very different risk factor. If you're a social person and you're out partying socially and you're handling your business or you're staying in your room and you're drinking because you're sad and depressed, that's a very, very different issue. We treat those kids very, very differently in treatment. Then kids have to have a different approach to what's going on. Um, and so that's really, you know, the dynamic of it. Again, this model is just something that I use. It puts it in perspective for me. And then as we go along, the addict or the chemical dependent person, yes, they have to fit this criteria in a DSM, you know, all that stuff. Because if they don't fit into that, you can't treat them and all this stuff gets involved. But you have to take a person where they're at in order to get them treatment. How many addicts go, I think I have a drug problem. I, I want to go into treatment. Very, very rarely. Very rarely. And then when they do, when they're ready to go, they go, no, I changed my mind. Right? That, that's what happens. You'll get, yeah, yeah, I want to go, I want to go. Then when it's time, no, 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 I'll go tomorrow. I'll go next week because I got something going on. So it almost never happens. Most people that get addicted to drugs, they don't just start off being addicted. Again, with the exception of people that are introduced by the medical community, maybe by accident, you know, they take the pills and they're not chemically dependent, they're addicted to drugs. That person can go into a pain management approach to get off of those pills, no problem. Relative, they're trying to manage their pain legitimately, right? So that approach is a very different approach and someone that's chemically dependent and gone through this process, right? What's the gateway drug? I don't know. In my 25 years experience, it's tobacco first, then it's alcohol second. Over the past three years is the first time in my life I've ever seen, I, and I don't know even numbers, but I've ever seen a large group of kids that started with marijuana and not alcohol first. I've never seen that for 25 years. 
All of a sudden, over the past couple of years, I see more kids than I never drank, but I started smoking, you know, weed, I started smoking. And, and it's just, it's an interesting dynamic. But the gateway drug, if anything, is alcohol, for sure. Okay. Hands down, most, most people that become addicted to opiates and cocaine and, and, and all that other, you know, uh, stuff usually start off with alcohol some, and cigarettes before that, yes. I would say that because um, with alcohol, um, you know, you're drinking at a party, and then when you're at the party, you know, there's going to be other drugs there. When you're drunk, you're not thinking about it too much. You start experimenting there, you know, not so much when you're high on pot. You know, you're not thinking about doing another drug. I think when people are drunk, they start thinking about, oh, maybe I'll try this, I'll try that. So I kind of agree with you on that. Because it's a mood and mind-altering substance. So what you normally wouldn't do, you get losing, oh, yeah, I'll do it, why not, right? Yes? Um, I also think that, I mean... For kids, marijuana might be harder to find, but it's easier to get high off of than alcohol. Alcohol is more of like a, like you work to get drunk. Right. You know what I mean? Right. You, you can take like take, 10 you shots, you right? You take two hits of a joint. And, and you're high. And you're instantly high. Yes. So, so the, the availability into your system is, mm -hmm. is easier available too. Mm -hmm. You were going to ask the question. I just think a lot of times too, even alcohol is more socially accepted. Yeah. So, yeah. So you become dependent on you know something that's socially accepted. It's not you're not doing something illegal per se. It's legal to drink after twenty. And it's a There's, social thing that leads to. Yeah, it's even more. Um, it's socially accepted, and it's socially promoted, and it's socially bombarded into your brain system. And you know, if advertisement didn't work, they wouldn't pay a million dollars for the Super Bowl for 30 second commercial. Just wouldn't do it, right? So seeing this stuff all the time, you know, there's a guy, does anyone know who Sigmund Freud is? Uh, yeah. Sigmund Freud's the, the godfather of psychiatry, right? Whether you like him or not, but see, that's not who I want to talk about. He has a nephew, his name is Edward Bernays, right? Edward Bernays, back in like the 1930s or something, Edward Bernays was a businessman, and Edward Bernays hooked up with his uncle and all of his uncle's theories in psychiatry and all that stuff, and he used that information for marketing, and that became the, the beginning of American capitalization, TVs and commercials and marketing, and they perfected this marketing system that especially in America, we just want to buy, right? Everyone loves to shop. We just want to watch. It's not an accident. They promote this stuff. They promote it all the time, every day. And this is with alcohol, and now they're doing it with medication on TV, right? They're promoting medication all the time. You don't see cigarette commercials anymore, right? You don't see anyone in movies or in regular TV smoking. Back in the 50s, 60s, everyone smoked. You watch TV, you watch old films, everyone smoked cigarettes. You don't see that anymore on regular TV shows. You don't see a TV, you don't see cigarette ads outside. Because after they made so much money and they killed so many people, they said, okay, we gotta fess up here, and they turned their money into education. And that was a perfect example of how education and, and an aggressive movement worked, right? A lot less people smoke cigarettes now than they used to, right? So again, I think if we talk about it and we have the right dynamics, I think we can make some progress in the issue. Now we're talking about it. Now people are dying all over the place every day. It's got our attention. And now people are seeing it. I've been seeing this for 25 years in my professional life, my whole life. I grew up in an urban environment. I've been seeing people die from drugs my whole life. And now I'm finally seeing, like, wow, we're really having this discussion. You know, people are talking liberally about drugs and what it's doing and marijuana and, you know, and we're having a dialogue. And I think this is, this is a really good start. Yes? Do you have any suggestions um, from a community relations standpoint on what communities can do to raise awareness and um, kind of put a bigger focus as a community um, in general on prevention and awareness? That's a really good question. Working from an adolescent perspective, I would say in general, you want to open the dialogue and don't act like it's bad. You know, when you're, when you're telling kids, um, um, you know, don't do that, it's bad, it's bad, and you, and, you know, and they experience something very different, you just disconnected that whole population because you don't know what you're talking about. You know what I mean? So I, I think it's important to say, well, okay, you get high, you know, why? What's the benefits? What's the advantages? What's the disadvantages? So I think community education, but from a very open-minded perspective, and listen to what people are saying. So if people are saying to you, I get high because I'm bored. There's nothing going on in this town. This is stinks. I gotta, you know, every day I come home and you, you shouldn't be bored. You should, when I was your age, I did this and it. 
But they're bored. They're telling you, why do you get high on board and no one addresses that issue? No one says, well, let's go get an athletic program. No one says, let's go build a park. No one says, let's go. So this is part of the problem, to have that dialogue and discussion and listen to what people are saying. I think that's a good starting point, to really hear what people are saying. I also think, too, uh, like the grateful that when they that aren't addicted and they're telling you, oh, that's bad, bad, bad. It's not so much that they're wrong, it's just that they're uninformed about what addiction is really about. Like, uh, they don't understand that. It's like, why can't you just stop? Like, people don't understand what? the fact that you can't stop. The addict don't know. Yeah, that, exactly. I don't know why I can't stop. So I, I, think, I think as far as towns and just raising awareness, like, we need to... I guess, the, I don't know if it's the right word, but desensitize the reality of like addiction is real, it's here, and like, and we, like you said, we need to have an open dialogue about it. Yeah. We right. need to be open. People need to not be afraid to say, I need help, I'm addicted, because it is very frowned upon. And I mean, it's obviously, to an extent, it's not good. You know, obviously. Right. And, and I don't know if you'll ever get rid of it. No, I don't think so. Know. The stigma of it, I don't think so. Yeah. And, and I, you know, marijuana. <laughs> Marijuana, we'll use marijuana for an example. It's 2016. Um, politically, they're legalizing marijuana, right, in places like this. is like in, crazy, right? It's incredible, right? Um, marijuana is illegal for many reasons, mostly political, right? So people that I know, right, that smoke marijuana, people that I know, that have a medicinal marijuana, because in New Jersey you can get medical marijuana. I don't know if anyone realized that, right? So people that I know that get medical marijuana, they smoke marijuana, they love marijuana, they have a medical marijuana card, they are embarrassed, terrified, ashamed to go to the medical marijuana clinic, the dispensary, and order marijuana, because it's so ingrained in your head that this thing is the devil, right? And I'm not saying it is or it's not. What I'm saying is that our concept and philosophy of drugs is a real important issue and to just open up the dialogue and talk about what's going on is very important because you know if you have cancer you have to talk about it you have to tell the doctors something's going on here they got to look and explore and do tests and you have to be able to identify what's going on and you have to listen to the patient you know you can't you say to the patient nothing's wrong you know go ahead you go home and no, something's wrong, Doc. I'm telling you something's wrong. You have to listen to that person. So I think it's just important to open up. And, and, and a lot of people, um, again, when I said before that people can use heroin socially, sometimes I get, ah, what is this guy saying? Or, you know, and, and it's important to open up that dialogue and say, well, what do you mean by that? I strongly disagree, but what do you mean by that? And I'll explain to you. Right? So as I explained to you, and now we can start to have that dialogue, it's important. I don't think you're going to get the addict because they're still living on the river of denial. And so I don't think you're going to get that conversation, but the conversation for their friends, the girlfriend, the boyfriend, the parents, their aunts, their uncles, everybody else out in society needs to know that so that we can bring it out in, in the public. Mm -hmm. And my kid, I need help. Where do I go to get help? Because before it was like, oh no, it's not my family. No. Right. And that addict usually feels ostracized, isolated, ashamed, embarrassed. They don't, they don't, they're already feeling bad enough. Yeah. Now that they ask for help, it's, it's shameful. They don't want to, you know, again, Europe, and I've never been to Europe. I, let me just start off by saying that. But I do a lot of reading, right? I, I just... I read a lot about this stuff. Europe, in parts of Europe, the addict is treated, it's just a medical condition. It's no big deal. You went to a clinic, yeah, I'm strung out on heroin, you know, whatever, whatever, and they treat you as a medical condition. You know, here, we don't, and again, it's because it's just a different philosophy. Oh, I was going to go on to that. I think a lot of addicts um, don't really look to see or seek for help here because of how we view them. And when they come out, they're worried that they're going to get in trouble. And like you were saying, over in Europe, it's treated as a medical problem, you know, they're, they're looking to help them. Over here, you, you come out here as an addict, you can, you know, get jail time, you're going to look at it as a bad person and everything, so it's just like a different stigma, like you were going on about. So when you get that addict that finally, finally, finally wants to go into treatment, that finally, finally, finally wants to do something, and out of the thousand times that they've been, you know, coaxed to get there, and they said, no, 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 they get that one opportunity in life, that they go in to get treatment, and they go into a program that says, you know, 
That's it. You're an addict, once an addict, always an addict. This is the model. This is what we have here, 12 steps. Every day, this is what you got to do. And then and they go, nah, this is not really for me. I don't, it's not quite where I fit in. And, you know, and they go, no, you're in denial. You got to do this, you got to do that. And that person leaves. What's the chances of getting that person in treatment again? They got to be suffering really bad before they make a decision to go back. When the pain of being straight outweighs the pain of being high, the addict will always get high every time. Right. Every day. That's just the way it works. So when that person comes to that situation where they want to get treatment, you got to work really hard to see if you can get them the right treatment. And sometimes that's the most difficult thing is accessing the right treatment. You know, and I've worked in a lot of programs. Everyone comes in, so one, one size fits all. And again, I think as a treatment world, we're learning a little bit. We're, we're, we're getting more sensitive to these things. And that's what I'm optimistic about. What would you recommend then from the correction? Because obviously that's why I came. I want to see what we're, we might be doing wrong. Because we have them, drug court, I don't know if you know about drugs, but yeah. okay, mandates that they go to, to, you know, go out into these programs. Right. And I swear to God, one was out for one day and came back, and from one drug pass at night to the next one, they were back in the jail. Yes. And I'm like, what the hell happened? So, and this is not, this is not an uncommon problem. No, well. So I, what do, like, what should we do? Short of opening a post office box in the lobby for these people, what should we do with them? No, this is a really complicated question because there are some addicts that is just never going to get help. There are just some people that just don't want help. They're never going to get help. They, not to say that I would ever give up on anybody, but some addicts just don't want it. I mean, they just like... They're okay with being who they are. They've come to the, the conclusion, this is me. I've been doing this for 40 years. I'm all right. You know, this is more your problem than my problem. The, that is the, the attitude. You're absolutely right. right. Some people are just like that. And, and they have no hope to even fathom that anything could be any different. But what you're talking about, we're sending these people. Let's say I have a drug. Let's say you're the, the probation officer, right? I'm, I'm the drug clinic, right? Mm -hmm. I have a contract with you and all of probation. So everybody you send to me, I get dollars and cents, right? Doesn't matter whether they fit into my program or not. I'm gonna just take them bodies. And that's what happens. So out of that, I worked in residential treatment. It's called a TC model, right? A therapeutic community. There's a Daytop Village is one, um, Straight and Narrow, Integrity House. These are places that have been around for 40 or 50 years, right? It's called a therapeutic community. Now. These programs are very, very effective for a certain population, for a certain person. I'd say maybe 10% of the people that come in them doors, okay? So if they really sorted people out and they got the 10% of people that really do well in those programs, I think their success rates of treatment would be much higher than if they just said, well, it's either this program or jail. Most people are gonna go, eh, I'd rather go to this program, you know what I mean? Some people go, I'd rather go to jail because I can get drugs easier there. Yeah. Okay? So, That's the truth too. yeah, no, I, I know. I'm, I, I've been doing this for a little while, so I see all this stuff, you know, on a regular basis. And, and again, I think the problem is they're not, you know, cancer is cancer, right? Do you, treat, do you treat lung cancer the same way that you treat skin cancer? Do you treat, there's all different approaches. There's, there's different types of chemo, there's different types of things that you use. You can't just treat. Everybody that has a drug issue, we'll say drug issues, I don't even know if they're addicted. I work with a lot of kids, they get busted selling drugs, they're addicted to the money. They're selling heroin in Patterson, they're making a thousand dollars a day. They're addicted to the money, they're addicted to the power, they're addicted to the glory, they're addicted to being the man on the block. They're not, they don't even use the drug, that's a, dr that's a problem, that kid's got a problem. How, how are we going to tell this kid who's, whose family's poor, you know, they get $300 a month for their kids, how are we going to tell that, that kid that he has to give that up and now go out and get a job or something to do something. It's a very complicated situation. So what you're talking about is a very complicated issue, but I think, again, you go to a program, there's not enough programs, and people say that we need programs, we need, we need diverse programs, we need the right programs, we need a whole, every, everyone's different. We need to put that person to the right place that they need. There's very good programs that are very multifaceted. They cost fifteen thousand dollars a year, twenty thousand dollars a year. Some of them ten thousand a month. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? They're some of these, and, and they don't take insurance. They're very good programs. You know, so this is part of the problem. 
all of the money that we spend in corrections, I mean, it's just astronomical. The amount of money that goes, you know, it costs like $35,000 a year to lock somebody up and like 15,000 a year to educate a kid. They're closing schools all over the country and they're opening prisons because that's one of the next most profitable industries in the planet is private prisons, very, very profitable. So again, it's a socioeconomic issue. It's political. It's very, very involved. These issues are very involved. But the answer is to get them and force them into treatment and give them the opportunity, but you got to have the right treatment. A lot of kids come in, they get busted with drugs, they don't even get high. But they got to go somewhere where they're going to go to jail. Well, the other thing I find is they don't have enough support system. Once we treat the problem, because there's, believe me when I tell you, there are kids in that jail send them back that out. have so much potential. And the one stood in front of my med car crying because she said, I'm going to get out of here in a day and I got nowhere to go. That's right. So there's no support system involved either. So I think there has to be more like or interlocking. Tra or transition. There's no, or transition. There's no transition. There's, and especially in Sussex County. And there's no transition on the other end, right? We're in this country. You can't use alcohol, you can't use alcohol, you can't use alcohol. You're 21, go out and drink and be responsible. That's a problem, right? We don't talk about these things. We say, no, 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 don't do it. Don't. We don't talk about respecting it. We don't talk about there's choices in life. You're at risk. Your grandfather was an alcoholic. Your father was an alcoholic. There's high risk factors here. We, we're, we're ashamed of these things sometimes. We, shh, no, I don't want to tell them, you know, that's part of the problem. We don't talk about what's available. We don't talk about what's out there. We don't talk about the realities of the situation. Everyone's saying politically, more programs, more programs, more. It doesn't matter if it's not the right program. You're going to open more programs whoever's opening a program and wants to make money. That's not what this is about if you really want to help people. You need, you know, there's a lot of money in corrections. It's a lot of money in, you know, all kinds of other things. If you took some of it and put it in the right services, I think you're going to see remarkable results. But that's a whole other, you know. So again, I think, but as it comes more and more... Um, to the forefront and as people are discussing it. And I think from a treatment perspective, we're much smarter than we were 20, 25 years ago. And um, I think that they've realized that you need to take that person where they're at and work with them where they want to go. It's not where you want to cram them. That just doesn't work. Have you ever seen any model programs for what I was just talking about and on the corrections level? For like the drug court? No, on the corrections level, like they went just the other day, we sent three inmates to a Spanish-speaking only rehab, so they were back within two days because they didn't speak, they didn't speak Spanish. Spanish. Right. And oh, I'm wow. like, oh, that was a perfect fit. <laughs> but um, you know, did, have you ever seen any program like you were talking about in Portugal in this country? No, I, I, I there's programs. Uh, there's a, a Karen Foundation in Pennsylvania, um, very, very, very expensive. Uh, they're very, they do a really good job. Um, I've had, you know, a couple of people throughout my my journey that have gone to a place called Hazelden in Minnesota. It's a one of you know um, that that they do addictions from a multifaceted perspective. I think um, most programs now, back in the '80s, right, drug treatment was paying about five or six hundred dollars a day for someone to stay into a rehab. Right? Then somewhere in the early 90s, late 80s, they made what they call dual diagnosis, right? Psychiatric issues with chemical dependency. And they just started pumping prescriptions into everything, right? ADHD came along, Ritalin, right? Everything. Now the psychiatric industry took over and the money for substance abuse, now they were paying $150 a day for someone to stay in for pure drug treatment, but $800 a day for someone that had duly diagnosed condition, right? So now they started to flood our society with mental illness, right? And I mean, this is the byproduct of, of what was going on. So now they're starting to pay more for drug treatment. So when people want to go to drug treatment now, there's some really, really lavish places that you can go if you have good insurance. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you want to get high just to be able to go to this place and go on vacation. Some of these places are really, really nice. And I, again, they're luxurious, they're beautiful, they're, you know, I work with these people, they're, they're going, just get me some bodies, you know, send us bodies, we get, get us people in, we'll take care of them, they have all this nice cushy stuff, but I don't know if they're really addressing the people's issues, I don't know if they're addressing what's happening that making, are making people broken, you know, to get there in the first place, and that's really the problem, I don't know that they're 
addressing the issues. They're treating the symptom, you know, rather than the substance of what, what's going on with people. You know, the, the hardest part um, about finding a program for certain individuals is, you know, I've been to TC programs. I've been to semi-TC programs. I've been to, you know, just a leisure of rehab, and I've been to uh, $80,000 rehab in Florida uh, for a month. Um, and I think it's, it's more or less what the addict, you know, you can say, oh, this is what the addict needs. But until that addict truly wants it to happen, and you can send them to the passage of Malibu, or you can send them to a Damon house where it's straight TC, no facial hair, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, you know, no, stay alive, nice. thank you, you know, the whole deal. Um, you know, even if you go through all of them, I, I went through all of them flying colors, no sanctions, because I'm on drug court, I got a week left. Um, you know, and, and, and it's hard to be like, you know, let's get this added to this type of rehab, because <coughs> you know, it all comes down to attic, and it's hard, because until it clicks in their head, mm -hmm. then, then the changes start to happen. You know, each time I went to rehab, I brought something else out of it, you know, but I still relapse. I still relapse. But that's part of it. That's you part know, of your process. That's part of, you know, part of the whole process. You know, that's part of your process. Yeah, yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Some people can get it like that. So, uh, you know, uh, Eric and Billy, if they want to speak. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I was born and raised here. Um, I got high here and I got clean here. Um, everything Ray talked about is uh, pretty spot on from an addict's perspective. Um, there is, uh, I think a lot of this has to be desensitized, especially in our town, and can't be swept under the rug anymore. Uh, but I think we need to do it as a community. I don't think it's one person's fault or one, one thing. Um, there is, there is great programs that are in this town, uh, alone, um, New Life Recovery Center is right up the street, it's a great IOP, um, they really can turn kids around, especially with all kinds of addictions, alcoholism and stuff like that, that's where I attend for a year, um, but yeah, I know, uh, addiction's here, everybody knows it, you know, it's, uh, it's our, it's our brothers, our sisters, our mothers, our fathers, it's here. Um, but recovery is real, uh, just as real. We can change uh, as a community, as individuals. Um, yeah, I mean, the support from you guys is, is key. Support from the town, uh, county, state. Um, just raising awareness, uh, helping those who are addicted and helping those that are too young to know what it's about, giving them the awareness of what it's addiction really is. Uh, I believe that's the, uh, the biggest help that we can do for our town. Thank you. Oh, yes. What made you want to stop? Oh, as you said in your presentation, um, if somebody figured that out, they'd be a millionaire. Uh, I've been to many rehabs, uh, all different kinds. Um, I just got sick and tired of being sick and tired. Uh, once I found out there was a better way to live, because I thought that's the only way to live, is drugs and alcohol. Once I found out there was a better way to live, I ran with it. Uh, I work on myself on a daily basis. I'm human, I fall short, but um, my worst day clean is my better than my best day using, and that's for sure. Can I ask how old you are? I'm 28. So you spent 25 years developing into the person that you were. Yeah. It's gonna take a long it's time, It's gonna take right? long, if not longer, Just absolutely. But uh, as we were talking about during the break, it's a, it's a one day, one day at a time. That's all we have, and that's for everybody. Addicted, not addicted, uh, all we have is right now. Tomorrow's not promised, and yesterday's over. And, uh, you know, I think for addicts, if we stay in that mindset, uh, we can accomplish a lot. For sure. I'm Bill. Um, I also grew up in West Milford. I'm 30. I've been to many rehabs, like Eric. Um, Put on probation, screwed it up, put on drug court. So the last seven years of my life, I've been kind of structured. 
mm -hmm. only the last two years I really grasped on to the whole concept of doing the right thing. Um, going to high school with Eric to talk, um, going to other high schools to talk. I went to middle school to do a game of life in uh, Pompton Tuesday. You know, and I even had the, the, the detectives call me, you know, and ask, Bill, what do we do? What do we do here? I've been, you know, to houses where the family's afraid to say anything, you know, oh, I'm worried about my job, I'm worried about this. And I always tell them, I'm like, listen, you, would you rather have a criminal record or a death certificate? You know, but, you know, it's not 1950s, we don't hide this anymore. It's mm -hmm. not, you get beaten in the house, it stays in the house. No, Every, you know, everybody, I'm sure everybody in this room, or 99% of us have gotten hit by addiction one way or another. That's right. You know, and you know they can't be afraid to be like, oh, you know, I, I I'm afraid to say something. People are gonna look at us weird. We're we're all weird, you know, in mm -hmm. our own way. So it's it's not something we can hide. Absolutely can't hide it. You know, mm -hmm. and it's like there's no more whispers. You know, this person doing this. No, it's it's not the junkie on the streets like we we're talking about in, in Harlem or in the Bronx. You know, it's kids that grew up playing sports. Mm -hmm. You know, kids that we were running, riding our bikes around, scraping our knees. You know, you know, good kids. You know, and I have I have an awesome family. You know, um, addiction didn't really run in my family. I got I got sisters. You know, a sister that can take pain medication without being addicted. You know, for me, I take painkiller. I'm off the races. Mm -hmm. I'm stealing your wallet. I'll be looking for it. Mm -hmm. You know, That's right. and. You know, it's it's something that we got to take a hold of, you know, and communicate. You know, everything's about communication from the addict to the family to the sister, the brother, aunt, uncle. Mm -hmm. You know, I have I have a cousin that's running. You know, hard. I try everything I can. You know, I know how it feels. I I can't sit there and tell him to stop. <laughs> all I say, all I ask him, just try to go light. As hard as that is to say, just try to go light. You know. Mm -hmm. um, I lost about 34 friends, you know, to, you know, car accidents, heroin, mostly overdoses, and that's a lot. That's, that's more than people in this room, mm -hmm. you know, all within five years of my age. Um, and what is it, six in the last, six in the eight last months maybe, just in West Milford, mm -hmm. or, or grew up in West Milford. You know, so it definitely needs to come to attention, can't be put to the wayside, mm -hmm. and, you know, there, there is hope. There's absolutely hope. You know, me and him both have excellent jobs. We were talking the other day. We're looking. We got, we got two brand new vehicles out there. Mm -hmm. and we're like, this is crazy. You would have told right. me that five years ago. Right. You know I would have told you to go home and clean your loops. That's, that's right. That's you right. Know, so, you know, there absolutely is hope. There is help. No matter how you get it, there's all different ways. You know, we, there's different inpatients, rehabs, counseling. But there, there's definitely a way to, for somebody to grab on. So don't ever lose hope on or turn your back on. You know, I, I think exposing them, let them know. Yeah, I know you're getting high. You know, let, let's let everybody know. Because the more you back something in the corner, but there's only so much we get wrong before, like, make a decision. you know, all right, just give me the help. You know, so I think exposing them, you know, being on them, you know, not mad, be like, I know you're high, but. You know, I just want to know you're alive. Even if you call me every hour and just say hi and hang up the phone, just so I know you're alive. You know, so it's the anger thing, getting mad at them, throwing them out of the house. Of course it happens. You know, it happened to me, but, you know, definitely uh, be there, as, you know, for one another, together, and, and don't fight about the attic. You know, be there and support them, you know, and just, just help them out, you know. That's pretty much it.